Hi, everyone. This is Diana Sinton. I'm the executive, executive director of UCGIS. Welcome to our um, exciting GI science and COVID-19 panel session. It's part of our 2020 UCGIS symposium. I am uh, going to serve today as the background technical person and run things as smoothly as I possibly could. Shortly, I'm going to turn over this session to uh, uh, Dr. Shilung Shaw, who is the from University of Tennessee Knoxville, who is the chair of our research committee. And then he will be going through and introducing our panelists for this session. As a reminder, your own uh, microphones in the as uh, audience members will remain muted throughout. If you have a question, please type it into the question chat space and um, and we'll be sure to be monitoring those as we go along. I'm gonna wait for another 30 seconds right now as we continue to have uh, many people. We were excited about the um, popularity of this panel. We had almost 200 people register for it. So uh, people are just coming in. This is a um, not as familiar an interface to many people, this GoToWebinar one. So uh, people are just now starting to get all of their logins complete. As a reminder too, the session is being um, recorded and we will be making the link open to everybody um, uh, by tomorrow, you'll be able to get one of those, one of those links. So in just a moment here, we will get started. Let's see. I am going to now slip into presentation mode for everyone. Presenter Diana and go into presentation mode. And Shi Lung, I think, let me know. I think we're ready to go. Everything okay. seem okay on the screen? Okay. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Diana. Welcome to the GI Science and COVID-19 panel session of 2020 UCGI's virtual symposium. I guess many of us would like to be with Karen Kemp in Hawaii now, but looks like uh, even going in virtual mode, we still have a lot of people signed up for this uh, panel session. So that reflects uh, how attractive our panelists are. So I'm Suren Shaw with University of Tennessee, also the current chair of the UCGS Research Committee. I will moderate the first part of this panel session, and then Jeremy Manis of Temple University, our incoming UCGS president, is my uh, co-moderator today. Uh, Jeremy is going to manage questions from the audience, and then uh, we will leave about 20 minutes towards the end of this panel session. Uh, then Gen Jeremy will take it over and moderate the questions and the open discussion part of this panel session. So, uh, Diana, do you have the PowerPoint slides? Okay. Everybody see, because on my screen, I cannot see the PowerPoint slide. Hello, Diana? Yeah, yep, we are showing the um, audience. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yep, let me just, uh, having a one little mini, there okay. we go. <laughs> okay, so the objective of this, uh, Conversation is to obviously talk about GI science and COVID-19. And we are very pleased to bring together five distinguished panelists and also the online audience to explore how the GI uh, science community can address all kinds of impacts and changes that COVID-19 has brought to you know, affect uh, the health, economic, social, environmental, political, transportation, and the many different systems in societies around the world. 
And uh, some of our panelists, uh, to my knowledge, also will share some highlights of their ongoing COVID-19 related projects. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so first let me quickly introduce uh, our distinguished panelists. Dr. Amy Friedlander is the acting office director of the Office of Advanced Cyber Instructure uh, at NSA. And Dr. Patricia Solis is a, a faculty member uh, at uh, Arizona State University and also co founder and the director of Youth Mapers. And Dr. Michael Emch is a professor in geography and uh, epidemiology and also fellow of the Carolina Publishing Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Next slide, please. And uh, Dr. Catherine Stewart is a professor in Department of Geographic Information Science and is also director of the Center for Geographic Information Science at the University of Maryland. And uh, Dr. Xiaowen Wang is professor and head of the Department of Geography and the Geographic Information Science at University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. Uh, Xiaowen also is affiliated with several other departments at UIUC. So welcome uh, to our panelists and we appreciate all of you taking time to join us today. So we are going to get into the questions right away. Uh, we have some pre-prepared questions that we will have discussions with the panelists. Then we will move to the uh, uh, questions and uh, discussion session. Oh, sorry, uh, Diana already mentioned, uh, the audience can submit questions anytime during this panel session using the questions function in GoToWebinar. Uh, which is slightly different from Zoom. And uh, uh, Jeremy is going to monitor those questions and uh, then ask those questions on behalf of the audience during the questions and uh, discussion uh, section of this panel session. Thank you. Next. Okay, at this moment, I'm going to turn off my webcam to reduce the traffic flow, uh, taking up the bandwidth. But our panelists will uh, stay online, both audio and uh, video, okay? I will see you later, but I will keep talking, <laughs> okay? So question number one, we would like to start with this question to learn more about the research and other relevant activities that each panelist is involved in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a required question for all panelists. And uh, so can each panelist take two to three minutes to briefly introduce yourself and uh, your work? Uh, how about we start with Amy and then followed by uh, Patricia, then Michael, and then Catherine, and uh, then Xiaowen. Uh, so Amy, please. Amy, you probably need to unmute yourself. Do we have some technical problems? Yeah, there we go. Real estate yeah. is the technical problem. This is different from doing it on my very big monitor in Eisenhower Avenue. So, um, Thank you for your patience, um, and thank you for inviting uh, me to join you today. As you've been told, I'm the acting director at the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many familiar names and to actually see some faces, at least four of them, uh, for names that I see so very frequently. Um, as you know, OAC, my office, uh, deals with advanced high-performance computing systems, large-scale uh, software and data CI systems, including fairly extensive systems that both employ GIS technologies and more generally look at issues in the spatial sciences. 
And finally, uh, we have a small but growing uh, program in learning and workforce development activities that enable this ecosystem of resources to serve the scientific research enterprise. More specifically with respect to COVID-19, the NSF issued a call for RAPIDS, I think about two months ago, that call uh, was in the form of a Dear Colleague letter, three Dear Colleague letters, I believe, uh, that have since been archived, but subject uh, pursuant to that, we have been making a, a, a range of awards across the foundation to address the many dimensions of, of the pandemic. And we understand that the spatial sciences have much to contribute. Um, and indeed, a number of these that may be not directly focused on the spatial sciences nonetheless have spatial implications. So anything, for example, um, in epidemiology, network analysis, and so on and so forth, necessarily uh, deals with uh, whether explicitly or not is talking about space dimension. The second one is the CI or Computing Innovation Fellows Program. One of our concerns from the start was uh, the effect that interruptions in the research enterprise would have on students either just about to complete their PhDs or who had recently re uh, completed their PhDs. Uh, the size, my home directorate made a large award to the CCC and the CRA to provide two-year fellowships to support postdocs uh, either just after degree or about to, uh, to complete degree again to maintain the continuity of the research enterprise so uh, i call your attention to https slash labs all lowercase cifellows2020.org for further information um, we, we really feel that one of the most powerful things that we can do obviously is to sustain the students and to um, to, to sustain this particularly vulnerable group and then the third major effort is the advance is in the area of advanced high performance computing. NSF is paying, playing a key role in the HPC COVID-19 computing uh, consortium that was initiated by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, I, I'd say about two months ago. Uh, this effort comprises an array of public and private computing resources and making them available work, uh, to researchers who are working on COVID-19. Uh, these researchers are, are not uh, purely N uh, NSF or NIH. There's also DOE, there's CDC, there's a number of agencies that frankly I don't see that frequently coming through uh, requesting allocations on our resources. We also are making available cycles um, uh, made through the private sector, through the cloud, and so this is a really um, just to look at it, frankly, is, is a wonderful self-organizing uh, group to enable good science to proceed quickly on, a multi on, on multiple platforms. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of these that I could talk about. Um, possibly the most dramatic one uh, was Romy Amaro's work. Uh, Dr. Amaro is at UCSD. This work was funded by the NIH, and she was given an allocation on Frontera, the leadership class system. And her work focuses on development of computational methods in biophysics for applications to drug discovery. As early as March 22nd, she released an animation that showed the full-length SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And you can, it's quite amazing. You can see it on YouTube if you haven't. It kind of pulses at you. And you have a sense then of what becomes possible in this uh, rich environment. So that's some of what we've been able to do. And I actually kept that to two or three minutes. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, Patricia, please. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you to UCGIS for the opportunity to just share some, some thoughts about how we as geographers and uh, geoscientists uh, will be able to uh, take advantage of this basically an inopportune time to showcase what our science, what our discipline actually can offer to, to the world. Um, I've been interested in many years about that intersection between uh, the knowledge that is produced and created in our academic and intellectual circles and the broader public and decision makers. And I have to say that um, this is pretty unprecedented, both the challenge that I think faces us as a community and the opportunity that we have to really make a difference. 
Um, there's a couple of different ways that I think about this. Um, there are um, activities that we're undertaking uh, that are in response to the pandemic itself, maybe dealing with the epidemiological tracing. I think the public uh, has seen uh, through all of the graphics and visualizations of how the virus has moved around the world, uh, that this is a spatial temporal phenomenon. And I don't think that there's anything um, precedented in the way that, uh, that has been very visible that geography has a lot to do with this. Uh, and then there's also the reaction to the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of work that is going on in terms of what are the effects of the lockouts, the shutdowns, the um, slowdowns, the shut slowing of transportation. And then finally, what that landscape of decision-making is around both of those things together. There is sort of a mismatch really um, between the data that we have the jurisdictions of who are making the decisions about those, and then what are the impacts on uh, on people uh, in their everyday lives. And I think those are very interesting kinds of topics that we're trying to look at. Um, through the work that I've been doing with youth mappers in particular, I wanted to point out that there's a great opportunity to promote open geospatial data. Um, youth mappers is a consortium of student-led organizations on 209 campuses in 50 countries right now. It's just grown exponentially. And the ability to uh, just amass uh, the geography community globally to add information, geospatial information about where are the health assets um, has just proven to be uh, an initial response that has kind of overwhelmed uh, uh, my imagination, in fact. Um, there's uh, also in at, at Arizona State University, um, there's all sorts of uh, responses to epidemiological modeling. Uh, we're a part of an NSF rapid um, that Amy mentioned that is working with computer sciences to try to parse out what are the different spatial temporal pandemics, many different pandemics actually. There's many different models that need to be considered instead of thinking of it as just one model. And I think this community, the GI science community has a lot to offer and in collaboration with scientists from other fields, epidemiology, computer science, and uh, we're just beginning to explore that kind of work right now. Um, I think there's also those indirect things, things that geographers and as scientists we've already been looking at and that you might say that we pivot a little bit towards this uh, pandemic and what does that look like now, especially in terms of who's going to be affected the most um, health-wise, but also by the longer term consequences of the shutdown. So for example, uh, we're looking uh, in particular around heat resilience. We're coming on to the summer and when um, uh, the guidance is to be sheltering in place and you have a large percentage of your population that uh, maybe can't keep their homes cool and that shelter is not safe either, then what do you do? There's all sorts of questions that we can kind of pivot from and look towards uh, who are the most vulnerable in the responses to the pandemic. Um, the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience has a, a fellows group. We had 12 fellows last year and 20 fellows this year, and they're looking at all sorts of um, combinations of, of that with an equity lens. The food system, for example, how is access to food changing? Um, uh, how is interest in the uh, agricultural food system and where that lays out in the city and urban um, uh, landscape? is also another thing that we're um, investigating. Transportation and what's gonna happen when everything snaps back. We have one working on air quality and looking to see what is happening now and then when everyone um, uh, returns to some sort of new normal, what is happening uh, there. All of these questions have a spatial and a temporal dimension to them. And so I think this community has a lot to offer in terms of um, existing science, but also pushing the envelope on what kinds of innovation we could do with our methods. So I'll stop there. There's many other things that I'd like to talk about, um, but I'm anxious to hear what the other panelists have to say about their work as well. Wonderful, thank you, Patricia. Uh, Mike, it's your turn. Okay, um, so I'm Michael Amshire. Um, I'm in two departments at UNC Chapel Hill, geography and epidemiology. And 
I run the Spatial Health Research Group at, at UNC, which is made up of a lot of talented um, PhD students, postdocs, undergraduates. Um, and so when I say I'm involved with the research that I'm going to explain in a minute, it's really our research group. And you know, it, it spans um, collaborations within our group, but also in public health and medicine at UNC and other institutions. So I'm involved with one project in Ghana and three in North Carolina. So for those of you who know me know that I mostly study infectious diseases in other countries. We study malaria in Africa and cholera in Bangladesh and all kinds of um, spatial epidemiology and medical health geography studies. Um, so three of the projects that I'm involved with involve use serology, which is the antibody tests you hear about in the news, um, and, and also virology, which is the active disease virus tests with the nasopharyngeal swabs. And, and the goal is to understand the spatial temporal patterns of the, of, of the disease burden, as well as transmission and transmission risk. Um, and then the fourth project involves an analysis of the spatial temporal patterns of testing, um, of virus testing in, in the state of North Carolina using all kinds of um, hospital uh, lab and lab core and other, other uh, uh, testing data. Um, and um, so in the Ghana project, uh, we're describing the spatial temporal patterns of community spread of COVID-19 using both virology and serology and, and trying to understand the determinants, including sort of individual level and household level determinants and community factors. And one of the community factors is, is human mobility. So we're using GPS-enabled GPS smartphone trap, uh, tracking applications um, that uh, we um, um, are going to put on um, cell phones of um, people in communities in the capital of Accra. This, this study involves both work in rural areas um, and in urban areas. It's actually a um, NIH supplement um, and, uh, and, and uh, we're still waiting to hear whether we get it. We'll do it no matter what, but we'll do it better if we get the NIH supplement. Okay, so the North Carolina projects involve also serological testing, antibody testing, um, and to try to understand the, the spatial and sociodemographic seroprevalence of COVID-19 in hospitalized patients, non-COVID um, hospitalized patients uh, using age, you know, all different ages. So everybody that goes to the hospital gets blood samples taken and we'll be able to look at the remnant blood samples to see what you know, for all these asymptomatic people, what what the um, what the community zero prevalence is, and we'll also be able to map them because we have their addresses. Okay, we're the, there's a another study that's very similar to that in one county in North Carolina that uh, that in, is in a community study. So we're actually going to the households and and actually collecting blood and and look and and this is a, a cohort of people that was for another study and that one. Um, is is probably the best estimate of subclinical infections and the spatial temp temporal patterns of that. Um, and the last study that we're doing is um, on the spatial temporal patterns of testing in North Carolina, and we're going to um, look for where there's not testing available and and over space and time during the pandemic and uh and maybe identify some you know some testing deserts that that anecdotally have been um uh described to us by local public health officials so those are the projects we're we're actively working on thank you mike catherine you are the next one uh you need to have slides right Yes, so
Kathleen, did your slides come up or uh, did the presenter option or do you want me to show them from my screen? Um, let's do it from your screen because I'm told I have to quit something. So okay, yep. Hold I'll on one it. moment. Hold on one moment. That would be great. Thank you. Just a moment. And we can go right to the next slide. Let's okay. Get going. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so in terms of our geospatial efforts uh, in geographical sciences in the Center for Geospatial Information Science at the University of Maryland, We've been busy too. Um, we've been, as a number of groups across the country have been doing, we got involved quite early in mapping. And um, I was going to show you, but there's a link here, which I don't need to click on, but we have um, a great point pulse map showing cases um, at county level uh, for the United States. And in more recent times, uh, going globally. Um, uh, this is built completely using open source tools. Um, and one of the nice features of the map is a timeline going, so it, it goes back to the uh, January, cases from January, and then coming right up to the present day. And it's really incredible to, to go back and revisit the timeline and watch for uh, all 50 states, how cases progressed over time. And um, in about April, we also added, as I say, a global, some global coverage to the map as well. So that's been um, uh, an, active, an active effort. And again, using open source tools, Leaflet, Mapbox, eCharge, uh, eCharts. And uh, we uh, started out with I.3 acres data. We shifted over to Johns Hopkins data repository for data. Um, so that's been an interesting experience um, involved with the mapping. Next slide. Um, so one of our current efforts involves an effort between our joint program and survey methodology at the University of Maryland and Facebook, and also Johns Hopkins is involved as well. Um, and this is a COVID-19 world symptom survey. And you may have seen this Facebook on survey and you may indeed have, some of you may have participated in the survey. Um, it has been uh, offered both to Facebook users in the United States, but also all over the world. And our group is doing the all over the world part. Uh, and that has been a, a, a big project for us. Uh, it's been very, very interesting. Um, so Facebook and JPSM have been working on the survey design, sample weighting, etc. And we have um, built entirely the data pipeline for sharing this symptom survey. Uh, this data will all be available to researchers through a public a a data API that um, we have created and are serving at the University of Maryland. Uh, Jinchuan Fan, Yao Li, Andres Garcia, um, and myself have been involved in, in this project. Next slide. And so we're getting about, uh, about half a million daily responses from over 3,000 regions and about 115 countries in 55 languages. Um, so all of these different languages are being supported. And one of the key things about the symptom survey is that it estimates the percent of population with COVID-like illnesses. So there's a set of tick, box, tick boxes with a number of different symptoms. And depending on which symptoms you um, select for yourself based on what you're experiencing, you may be grouped into COVID, experiencing COVID-like illness or influenza-like illness or both possibly. Um, and so there's there's uh, different categories, and then we will be mapping those kind of results. Um, next slide. So on this next slide, we see a bit of a sneak peek of our country level map. So again, this is global globally. We're also ingesting the um, the U.S. survey is being handled by Carnegie Mellon, 
and so they are um, but we are ingesting the data for us as well as global um, again this is completely open source web-based gis framework that we've been building using open layers geo server post gis for the database and flask um, and so we'll be mapping for example percent of people with covid like symptoms or influenza like symptoms um, and this is the country level view that i'm showing you on this slide and if we go to the next slide we see the um, sub-country or a kind of region level, so like state or province or, you know, depending on that sub-level um, all across the world. Um, and as I say, the data will be available um, shortly, uh, and uh, so you can either just browse on the map or else actually use some of the data yourself in your research if you're interested. Uh, and Facebook um, will post information on how you can access the micro, how you can get a data use agreement to um, access the micro data, the survey response data, if you're interested. Next slide. So that's the COVID um, world uh, symptom survey. And um, in addition, we also have an NSF rapid. And then for this project, we're using passively collected uh, location-based app data um, to really take a look at mobility uh, in the United States um, during the period of the pandemic and quantitatively, uh, quantitatively measure change in collective movement behaviors. Um, next slide. And so uh, we've been starting to look at uh, Florida um, as one uh, case study that we've been interested in. And so I'm just showing you outgoing trips for Miami-Dade County is the most Southern County we see here. In the middle is Broward County. And then in the North, we have Palm Beach. Um, and so here we're seeing um, outgoing trips, trips out of at census track level. Um, March 18th was around that spring break time that got a lot of notoriety in the press and media um, for students having a nice spring break in Florida. May 6th is obviously a little bit more recently. Um, we may not detect from this present this visualization um, a lot of differences. There are some differences and this will be part of our project is to look at how mobility changes um, uh, over time. Uh, for these different counties. If I go to the next slide. Uh, and of course, if we add to it, for example, we are looking at, this is a 10-day uh, trip history at census track levels from May 1st to May 10th. And on the left-hand side map with the blue proportional um, circle symbols, um, that's COVID from May 18th. So approximately 10 days before, so looking at kind of travel 10 days out before we have COVID cases to just sort of see where we have active mobility, is there a relationship with COVID, what can we find there? Um, so we have COVID with the blue symbols, we have uh, um, just the distribution of black Hispanic population in the center map, and over on the right hand, map with the pink symbols, we have white non-Hispanic population. So more of a white population up in Palm Beach County to the north, um, and then as you go south, um, larger a black Hispanic um, population. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, we look only at um, just a quick view of Miami-Dade County, for example, and again, just looking at the similarity in distribution and what we've really seen and what many researchers are, are commenting on and noting is the, uh, as, as well as medical professionals, of course, uh, is the undue burden from minority and underserved populations with respect to, to COVID. Um, and so here we're just looking at, at Miami-Dade County. And so we're interested in kind of linking to mobility and understanding mobility um, and its relationship to these kinds of variables. Um, as well going forward. Um, and my next slide, uh, we also are working with um, colleagues in the School of Public Health, Dr. Shakobi Wilson, who is a specialist with environmental justice, and we've been doing a number of projects with him on environmental justice in Maryland and also in South Carolina. Um, so what we're looking at in this map is, is it's Maryland, it's Prince George's County. Um, and Prince George's County um, has a, had the highest number of cases 
Um, in Maryland, uh, today's count is 15,808 cases, so highest county in Maryland. Uh, Prince George's County butts right on to Washington, D.C., which you may have heard is a hot spot. And what I'm showing here is um, we have a, a project that computes an environmental justice index score for different counties and census tracts in, in Maryland. So we see this um, EJ score for Prince George's County, and we have COVID cases from May 15th. And you can really see again that the um, where the COVID cases are um, really overlap with uh, the um, EJ score, where we're you know concerned about air quality, walkability, different health-related variables, green space, distance to parks, um, those kinds of those kinds of things. Um, so uh, that's uh, another project that we're looking at. Um, we also have a, a supplement into NIH um, to look at the relationships between um, malaria and COVID in Southeast Asia. Um, and so I think that would be very interesting. And we will also, as um, Mike mentioned, that we, we would also be interested in kind of doing this work uh, as well, especially if this, the supplement is successful. Um, uh, yeah, so that's just some of the projects that we have going on right now. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Catherine. Very good. So, Xiaowen. Xiaowen also has slides. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, learning from uh, Kathleen's experience, just to stay with uh, Diana's screen. Okay, just give me five seconds to do the change here. Thank you. Oh, uh, that's the perhaps the yep, final slide. Yep, yep sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I could go backward. No, no, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for organizing this. Uh, the UCGS colleagues, I know, uh, have done a lot of work for putting this together in the middle of this uh, very um, unusual situation. And I've learned a lot from. Uh, the fantastic work shared by uh, the other panelists. So I'm gonna focus on one ongoing project called World COVID-19 for Mapping Multi-Scale Spread and Impacts of COVID-19 for uh, Spatial Decision Support. Next slide. Uh, so this is a screenshot of uh, a user interface of this uh, open platform called where COVID-19, you could actually click the URL on top of this uh, slide to uh, explore this, uh, this platform. But uh, the basic idea is to help users to uh, explore and discover patterns of COVID-19 as well as its impacts. Next slide. The project is really motivated by uh, many rare questions, and I think I'm preaching the choir. A lot of these questions are not easy to answer, and also answers to these questions tend to evolve. And uh, geospatial analysis and modeling are critically important to address these questions, but at the same time, we see a large number of uh, geospatial data portals and resources and a lot of these portals and resources are not yet informed by rigorous geospatial analysis modeling. So we see that is a gap that needs to be filled. And in order to address this gap, we often need to harness massive diverse geospatial data. And in order to do geospatial analysis modeling against such data, you really need advanced cyber infrastructure and HPC to make it work. Next slide, please. So I'm going to share with you quickly a case study, which is uh, focusing on rapidly measuring spatial accessibility to healthcare resources. We understand spatial accessibility is foundational to the mitigation 
of COVID-19 as well as related to a lot of other dimensions of this crisis, uh, for instance, uh, health disparities. Uh, so this study actually is now um, in the Med Archive. You could uh, click this link to uh, look at the paper. Next slide, please. A couple of questions the study was looking into. Uh, number one is really to examine to what extent Illinois re residents have access to healthcare resources during the pandemic. Uh, secondly, which geographic areas have resource surplus and which areas have resource shortage? Next slide. A quick snapshot, if you look at Chicago on the left and the entire Illinois on the right, uh, these are the sort of spots identified by spatial accessibility analysis. Darker colors indicate you actually have uh, better spatial accessibility to hospital beds for this map, but uh, certainly the analysis could be applied to other healthcare resources such as testing capacity and uh, uh, resources. But uh, looking at the entire Illinois, you could see the spots are better covered by existing hospital uh, resources and the beds, but uh, for most of the state, in fact, it's a variable. It's not so well covered. Now, if we look at, uh, for instance, broad rural areas, a uh, lot of uh, epi models now predict rural areas is going to be vulnerable coming either from the potential next wave or even the continuing spread uh, of COVID-19 and how do we get ready for that from the hospital health care resources and having such understanding of spatial accessibility is going to be important to get us prepared. Next slide. So going back to the platform, the link, if you click, you would be able to get to, there are currently two components. One is the app interface you saw showing dynamic maps, including both at the US state level and within the state county, and in some cases, zip code, and the census blocks and tracks level, but up to the world level. And one of the bigger challenges we see the community has started tackling is to be able to link from the local community level to the global level. And that's a sort of holy grail kind of challenge in geospatial analysis and the modeling, how you would be able to bring this spectrum together. So having a user environment for spatial decision support, allowing for the exploration of such patterns from the local community level to the global level, I think it's uh, gonna be very exciting and critical. And uh, at the same time, if as, uh, quite a few efforts already mentioned are motivated to enable decision making, reproducible analysis and modeling going to be uh, vital because in order to share the analytical results and including maps with the decision makers, we have to make sure the analysis and models behind such maps and analytical results are reproducible and the CyberGS X uh, notebooks are serving that purpose to allow uh, data scientists and uh, even decision makers to be able to repeat the analysis and models on the fly. Next, please. So this is my final slide. You saw a little bit earlier. Um, NSF, uh, uh, we have Amy here on the panel. In fact, this couple of uh, awards are coming from OAC. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we've been engaging with the local department of health, public health, and also the university communities coming together to get organized to help with the state and also beyond. Uh, and uh, of course, multiple units on my campus are fully behind this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Xiaowen. So we will save all of the questions uh, towards the end of this session in the question section. And again, a quick reminder, Jeremy Manis is monitoring the questions. You can use the questions function to post your questions. So, uh, Diana, can you bring back? Yes. Yeah, question number two. Thank you. So, all of the panelists already uh, mentioned that COVID 19 has highlighted the importance of geography in understanding and responding to infectious diseases. And we have seen many efforts of using GIS and GIS science to help address 
various challenges of, uh, related to COVID-19. So this, uh, starting from question two, not all of the panelists uh, are required to uh, answer these questions. So uh, whoever uh, wants to uh, address any particular question, please go ahead. So the question is, what is your assessment in terms of the main contributions from the TI science community to addressing these challenges, especially in a transdisciplinary collaboration environment? And to what extent is the GI science community recognized by other research communities and the policy makers? So any panelists would like to take the first shot? Okay, I'll break the ice since I was talking the last. I'll start first. I think the um, importance of geography and the GI science has been well recognized uh, especially as a glue, not only contributing the domain expertise, but also serving as an interdisciplinary and a transdisciplinary bridge for bringing different expertise together. And uh, you saw from, for instance, Kathleen's sharing, and I was impressed by her work, for instance, linking to different domains. And I think you see the role of uh, geography and GSI have played there as a, not only a uh, intellectually powerful capability, but also as a bridge. Um, and certainly, I think there are much more to do uh, in, in this context, um, and much more in terms of the crisis we have to uh, uh, resolve. I would say uh, going forward, it's uh, especially important to uh, reach out uh, to other related communities. And uh, I particularly liked the focus of this panel on the impact part of this crisis, because uh, if we look at the impacts, this is gonna be uh, long-term and it's gonna be many, many domains uh, required to understand how the impact's going to be un unfold. So I would uh, strongly believe to be able to uh, leverage the bridging power of geography and GIS to uh, uh, have more bridges developed to work with other related communities uh, would be uh, possibly more uh, fruitful uh, coming forward. I would agree with uh, what Xiaowen said, and I would, I would even um, add that I think that the main contributions from the GIS science community have still yet to be realized. I feel like there's been already a lot said about you know, the first stages of the, the reaction and the response in terms of getting the data out there, getting the data on where our assets are and where, uh, you know, where the impacts are being felt. Um, but, uh, you know, in moving forward to some sort of new normal, I think geographers and GI science community has a lot to be said in terms of the contact tracing. Um, you know, uh, Tristan Nesslin here at ASU is, has uh, convened a really stellar group around how that is a spatial, um, process and it needs a lot of attention from GI scientists in terms of um, doing it ethical and robust contact tracing, but also in terms of, of things that um, are important for decision makers, at what scale are the decisions being made? And can we use these uh, vast amounts of knowledge that we already have about how people behave um, to maybe do some creative um, uh, ways to help inform decision makers? Um, like uh, Wen Wen Lee here at, at ASU, is looking at containment geographies in, in the sense of um, how um, we can already understand how people are um, spatially behaving to not necessarily combining that with the contact tracing and, and trying to creatively come up with ways that we can make decisions uh, quickly and robustly without creating additional harm. And I think that some of those contributions are still yet to be seen. The contributions way down the, the road that really interest me in terms of resilience, things like um, you know, what is the impact on the air quality? What is the impact on transportation? How do we change our, our spatial behaviors and what impact does that actually have in the future? So I feel like now we're all very focused on uh, what COVID-19 means in terms of you know, the immediate response. But I, I again think that our, the main contributions are gonna be seen in years to come. 
Yeah, and I might I just follow up on a, a couple of those ideas that I think are long time focus in the GI science community on space time dynamics. We're in such a good place to bring this expertise to this problem and our long term interest in scale and multi scale modeling. And we're having to look at local and global and everything in between for this problem. And again, we're very well placed to look at that. And those of us who are interested in place-based research, that has um, importance here, significance here, and same with network-based approaches. Um, so we're actually, I think, a very key discipline that brings a lot of expertise to the table. Uh, there's a lot of interest in risk maps, risk maps of all different kinds, um, are being prepared and uh, we are experienced with producing different kinds of risks maps so we can be very useful in that kind of idea so looking at where the highest burdens are looking at the impacts of something looking for where gaps are that's something that I think we um, have uh, a record in big geospatial data handling um, these kinds of problems, these big mapping systems, et cetera, mapping at the global scale, um, open geospatial data handling. Again, you know, we're, we're recognized for this area. Um, and yes, I, I think all of our multidisciplinary, we, we are a domain that is very multidisciplinary right from the get-go. We kind of always have been. And again, I think we see that helping us during this time and putting us in a in a good position. I think also like Shawen was saying though, we still, you know, we probably still have some work to do in some areas within academia, highly regarded, well recognized, people will reach out outside of academia. In other quarters, maybe we still have some bridge building to do. Um, still a work in, in progress, uh, but a, again, a, a lot of opportunity. I'll, I'll follow up by saying that COVID-19 is is incredibly spatially variable and trying to understand um, the spatial patterns of, of incidents and transmission um, and also the determinants um, of incidents is something that we're well suited to and uh, and part of the question was about other communities, other research communities um, recognizing GI science. And so I um, don't think that most people know the what, <laughs> what GI science is. Um, most of my colleagues in, in medicine and public health think it's something to do with the GI tract. But anyways, uh, but they, uh, um, they do understand that this is a, a spatial problem and they need spatial expertise and they don't have it. And I um, have been involved at this kind of infectious disease work for my whole career, but I've never experienced so many people from these other areas of research needing spatial science skill sets to be added to their collaborations. Um, so I've actually not just done research in my group myself, I've been a sort of a clearinghouse because we can't handle it all. So anyways, maybe some of you want some of this work. <laughs> so I would just add to all of this, it's fairly obvious from the membership of this panel that NSF has, has long made sustained investments in uh, cyber infrastructure to enable uh, spatial geoscience research, as well as um, uh, sort of human-oriented spatial sciences more generally. And, and I think, as Shawen said, um, he talked about a grid. I think you could also think of it as a grammar that enables um, integration of data and models across multiple disciplines. Um, here I'm thinking of a lot of the work that we do in the um, biological and geosciences as well as human behavior. And so this, this gives you a grammar for um, overlaying these different kinds of information as all of you have demonstrated in different ways. I think increasingly one of the things we're seeing as well is the importance of spatial technologies 
um, to enable very broad-based data collection and analysis. And here I'm thinking of Keith Beckman's uh, Mid-Scale Research Infrastructure, SAGE, which is this highly distributed data collection system. And probably it's, it's a large team and you're all probably on it. And I can't remember who's involved with what. So my apologies if I've overlooked you. Um, but I think that increasingly we're seeing space as a variable in these kinds of analyses, as well as as um, it's both an independent and a dependent variable. We want to understand things in a spatial way, and we want to understand the implications of space for how um, natural and human phenomena, if you will, behave or could be understood. So um, this is really an exciting area in which to be involved. And um, whereas I never talk about what we are like, likely to do, I'm certainly delighted to see all the work that we have funded. Hey, thank you also. Clearly, GI science has a lot to offer and uh, it's equally important. We want to make sure people in other fields and the policy makers know what we can offer. So we will move on to the next question. Time really flies. Okay, so by now we have seen various impacts on and the changes in the human societies around the world caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are likely to see more changes and impacts down the road. So do you think the current theories, approaches, and methods in GI science are sufficient to addressing the forthcoming impacts on the changes in these different systems in human societies around the world? If not, what is missing in current GI science knowledge and GI science tools? And what should we do to strengthen these areas? This Anyone is actually, want to? <laughs> I, I would love to start because this is the question that I was really excited to, to have something to say about. I don't know that I would characterize it as something that is actually missing, but I know an area that is going to need a lot more attention uh, is is really about ethical uh, geoscience and ethic, ethical geography, ethical geo, um, and ethical AI in terms of uh, how that's intersecting with um, geospatial analysis. And you know that entails all sorts of things in terms of the responsibility that we have of getting it right, um, protecting people's data, the privacy issue. Uh, it also means that the work that we do is explainable to people, that, um, that that's the responsibility that we have, an ethical responsibility, that it can be understood and used in uh, ways that decision makers are actually um, able to, to use it. Um, but it also not doesn't just mean doing things the right way, but also, I think, doing the right things. I think there's an equitable equity issue that we all need to pay attention that's sort of wrapped up in all of that. Um, so whose questions are we answering? What types of questions are we answering with this very powerful science and this powerful tool? Are we looking at, are we, you know, turning our talent and our time onto questions that really matter? Um, and I, I do believe that many in this community is doing that, but is that enough? Um, are we answering the questions that the community needs answered to the most vulnerable people? Are, are we researching enough uh, in engaged ways with the community, the Navajo Nation, for example, really feeling the impacts of this? Are we doing enough? I feel like there's still a lot to be done in that sense in terms of the ethical and the equitable um, applications of all of this, but I do know there's a lot of people looking at that and working on it. I just wanted to emphasize attention, more attention needs to be paid to that. Thank you, Patricia. I, uh, I was going to say I completely agree. I think that's a vital area needs much more research to uh, understand what's going on. Another area of potential interest to I think our community and even beyond is uh, uh, I would say sp spatial prediction across the scales and I think we're overwhelmed by predictions of uh, epidemiologists looking at curves I feel like my brain's oversimplified looking at those curves and how to actually ground predictions into space 
and over time and uh, really contextualized into local communities and having that linked to broader scale uh, and the richer context. And I think that kind of prediction has much more to offer beyond the epic curves we're getting used to, at least by reading both papers and popular media. Uh, and this is not only just uh, the cases of COVID, but also the impacts, understanding impacts at local community levels and uh, above and beyond and linking the context and the scales and to be able to predict. And again, I think to achieve this kind of predictive capability, scientific power, I don't see that's going to happen without the enablement of cyber infrastructure to be able to harness the data from different dimensions and achieve desirable predictive capability. I, I think that's very exciting science. I think the um, sort of local to global challenges, it's not very often I feel in, in GI science that we get that opportunity to look at global scale. Um, I mean, that the pandemic is affecting, you know, a, the words a pandemic anywhere is a pandemic everywhere. And that has been uh, very, very challenging. Um, there's been practical challenges um, on the implementation side of, you know, mapping this rapidly evolving um, uh, pandemic, how to visualize a rapidly evolving global pandemic, you know, open questions that relate to visualization as well as rendering um, web maps at that level. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, many, many researchers, remote sensing researchers, other, other groups uh, are, you know, have, um, are working globally. Um, and, but this has really, has, has been uh, a new, a new task uh, for us to do. And there's definitely open challenges um, relating to that, I think. Good. Any other comments? Okay. So uh, clearly, uh, uh, Amy, do you have? Anything? Yes, I, I would just echo many of the thoughts that um, others on the panel have already said. Um, and and as you know, NSF increasingly supports cross-cutting data-intensive science through a, a number of programs. One of them is in my own office, Cyber Infrastructure for Sustained Scientific Innovation. Another one is NSF-wide, which is harnessing the data uh, revolution. I was pleased, Xiaowen, to hear you actually call it harnessing the data. I heard that. Well done. And then a, a third big idea program, uh, which is also data intensive, is the Convergence Accelerators, which is designed to look a little more near term than NSF traditionally looks. But these are three complementary ways to address problems that lend themselves to an integrative approach and the tools and uh, practices that enable that science. As we've heard already in this hour, um, the, the geospatial systems approach is particularly well suited to that, not just for looking at multiple kinds of data, but for looking across scales. I'm not minimizing how difficult that is. I'm saying it is a very powerful way to go about answering complex questions. So because we are always looking for scalable solutions, we find ourselves very frequently thinking and seeing proposals and good projects about space and therefore the spatial sciences. So um, we would say keep on doing what you're doing. Great, so sounds like at least we need to better connect GI science with humans and also human dynamics across different spatial and temporal scales. So uh, since time is limited, uh, we will move on to the next question. Okay, question number four is actually connected to what uh, Patricia uh, mentioned uh, in the last question. So the popular media have shed light on the use of geospatial technologies to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, in monitoring restrictions on mobility using Google location-based service data 
and the use of GPS embedded mobile phones for automated digital contact tracing and the quarantine monitoring. So what role does the GI science community have to play in the development, application, and the ethical use of this uh, ethical use of these geospatial technologies for these purposes? Michael, you are muted. Sorry about that. Um, so when we do research using you know GPS enabled phones um, that uh, monitor um, we we're you know monitor people's mobility and and you know collect data and, and that we're going to analyze we, we're we're within an IRB and and you know we are there's the ethics are are protected you know through the IRB and and monitored through the IRB but um but when when it's being used by you know for instance a, a police organization or a department of public health um then um you know we we don't obviously they're not within an IRP and so the ethics of that i think that our role is to do research on on what how these things are being used um and uh and, you know to be critical of 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 these kinds of methods as well um i don't do that kind of research myself but um i'm actually just using these methods to collect data and nobody else will see them other than our 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 research team within the irb but but i do think that you know the ethics of using it for sort of enforcement and contract tracing there there's something there but you know maybe you can do that research, Patricia, or somebody. Well, you, you know, that. I'm interested in that. Well, you know, there's a there's a there's a Latin there's a, a group there's a Latin saying that is nil de noves sine noves, which is nothing about us without us, and it really is about uh, sort of an ethic about having the research be engaged with the communities that it's affecting from the beginning and the decisions the, the people whose lives are affected by that decision. So. Um, I think that we really have a lot to think about as a whole scientific community, not just the GI science community or geographers, um, in terms of what does what role should science play in the use of all of science and technologies when we're talking about this really unprecedented era uh, where you have, um, you know, maybe popular media is shedding light on science in a new way, but there are also many different reactions to that. Um, some much more skeptical and cynical than others. We've seen um, cases where scientists, geospatial scientists have lost their jobs because of having some kinds of integrity around the data. So I think uh, we all do have to look up from where we've been and think about what are the implications of this because that, those, that territory is shifting a lot around us. And I think that uh, doing things the way that we have been before may or may not um, unfold in the same way in the future. So I think that uh, you know all of us, all of us should be talking about it, whether or not we're um, focusing our research. I like to think about also ways that we can hold our decision makers, not just inform them, but hold them accountable with the science that we're talking about. There, and I alluded to this earlier that there's this mismatch between the jurisdictions at which decision makers, the scale and the jurisdiction at which they're making these decisions and what data they're making them with and where they're held accountable for those decisions. They're not always lined up. They're kind of spatially incongruent, if you will. Um, so what can we think about in the way that we actually do our science that can bring those things back into alignment so that the decisions that are being made um, are being tracked and monitored and the decision makers are being held accountable at the same time at those same scales and spatial extents as the as the data and the research that we're doing. Uh, Shilong, um, I think we might have additional thoughts uh, here from the panelists, uh, given uh, the clock. Now we only have 20 minutes left. Uh, I wonder whether we should open the floor 
to yes, take questions you, from the audience. Yes, That's exactly what I was thinking. So as uh, promised, we want to have uh, at least 20 minutes for the audience uh, to have the questions and answers uh, session. So we are going to skip the next question and uh, move into the questions and answers section right away. So Jeremy, I will pass it down to you. All right, thank you, Shilong. Uh, hi, everybody, this is Jeremy Menes. I'm a professor at Temple University and I'm also president-elect of UCGIS. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the panel and thanks to everyone participating. Um, we have a question from the audience and uh, I invite uh, others, if they have questions, to just type them into the question box and uh, I will pass them on to our panelists. So I encourage all of you uh, listening to do that. Um, one question we did get that I think is a great question is, um, could the panelists please comment on the data availability for COVID-19 spatial analyses? And I'll just add my own kind of context to this question. I was writing down sort of questions on my own and I said, is this a turning point for data sharing for health data? Because I've been amazed at the data sharing that's going on among scientists, agencies, the media, the public. Um, it's really quite astounding. And it also sheds light on maybe the need that we have for uh, a better infrastructure for data sharing uh, among all these different um, participants in trying to solve this crisis. So um, I'd be interested in hearing from the panel on what they think about uh, data availability and data sharing. I I think it um, yeah it's 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 been it was it was quick to happen in many cases. I will say it varies um, depending what kind of data you're looking for and what spatial granularity you are looking for. So it's not completely even. Many, many states have adopted and many counties have adopted dashboards and we're seeing you know, dashboards um, everywhere with data. Sometimes the data is just that day's data and they're not releasing it um, there is not an archive for example in other cases there is data archived and that's fantastic so i think it it kind of varies but in general there is there's certainly a lot of data made available um, and for example the facebook survey that i i mentioned which is both for the united states and for for worldwide um, will be a, a great data resource made available for researchers Yeah, I echo what Kathleen said. Um, it's uh, still a variable situation, but uh, another related aspect is uh, certainly confidential data is still hard to get. Even people appreciate the value of making the data available uh, to uh, support decision making or conducting better science. It's still quite a hurdle to get a hold of the data quickly. Uh, and uh, as uh, Michael mentioned, you know, IRB is still the way going through for, for giving access to the data. So I had the experience working with Illinois um, Department of Public Health. Um, the, um, we're extremely motivated to, to share data and they even tried to get uh, governors executive order to uh, pass the data on quickly to us for conducting analysis, but uh, still uh, the process is energy consuming and you really need to go through some protocols to uh, to make that happen. So, so I think this crisis does present an opportunity for the geospatial community to understand how to address this data sharing challenge and uh, how to make data available at the same time, not leading to any harm or negative impacts. Uh, by not protecting the data well. Yeah, and individual level health data is has to be protected. And so there's no real shortcuts to that. And there's, you know, again, you start with the IRB and you 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 have laws like HIPAA and, and in other 
you know, and, and IRBs from the university. But um, so um, that being said, um, you know, there, there are, um, uh, I think that um, while, while like, for instance, the electronic medical record folks at, at the UNC healthcare system here, I mean, they're overwhelmed by data requests right now, but, um, but they're, they're really um, working hard to get the data requests, um, you know, to, to go through these data requests. And, and so it, it takes some time, but, um, you know, people are really going above and beyond. Um, I, I think that uh, um, aggregate level data, um, the, so things that would not um, have HIPAA, you know, uh, implications that are as, as, as difficult, at least, um, uh, those are things that um, maybe isn't completely a priority right now because the other data, because it takes some work to produce those data sets. However, the folks in our community that are willing to create those data sets, I think that there would be a lot of people willing to help to get individual level data moved to the aggregate. I do think, however, there is, while there are lots of data, there's lots of data out there and there's lots of data sharing out there, um, at least in the kind of work that I'm doing on incidents and transmission, you know, I mean, if you look at maps of the world, I mean, I've been on, I, I was on calls with people from many different African countries today, and uh, some of them really don't have many cases at all. And we, so one of the discussion was like, yeah, is that true? So really, you know, there's, there, it really has to do with how, how hard we're looking different places. And so we have to be, we have to scrutinize our data sets and not actually, you know, think about, they're really uncertain data sets, a lot of the data sets that people are using. I'd like to just add a couple, a couple slightly different um, thoughts to that. And one of the opportunities that I think of when you're thinking about data accessibility and, and data production is um, uh, like what Michael had said, uh, many places in the world where you just may not have any data and that bodes well for opportunities to produce volunteer geographic information. Um, our experience with the youth mappers, putting out just, you know, on OpenStreetMap, putting out all the assets was really tremendous. So I think we can see this as one, on the one hand, kind of an opportunity for ad adding more data that's durable for the longer term future. But I'm also very concerned about a really important data set that is supposed to be uh, in collection right now, 2020, the US Census, and how hard it is to uh, do the enumeration for that. Uh, it still remains to be seen what's going to happen in terms of response rates for the U.S. Census as a result of the pandemic. So I just put that out as a concern that I have of this really critical, important data set that we have for science, but it, uh, also for, you know, representation and for federal allocation. I think that's something that we should all keep an eye out for. Thanks very much. Uh, any other responses? I was just going to say about data quality um, and data uncertainty because we are hearing that there's a lot of it's a very fluid situation with data and kind of um, whether it's uncertainty or just the quality of the of the data um, we are hearing a lot of that um, I've noticed with the way Maryland is reporting so about testing etc um, so I think it is a kind of fluid situation and that's something that people should definitely keep in mind with their data um, and, and just using the data going forward. Very good, thanks. Um, any other responses? I think on that all note, right. Jeremy, before you move to another question, because sure. that's I think a very important note, from that data quality uncertainty point of view, I think that's where I, I believe spatial science has a big role to play to uh, make sure our community is stepping up to uh, do what we're supposed to be doing, contributing to, uh, to this uh, thorny problem because people are just grabbing data and producing maps without clearly going through uh, what has to be checked, uh, assuring the, the results 
are backed up by um, by decent data. So I think that's that's an important role. I think one of the questions posed earlier related to uh, any critical roles of our community, I do see that is a critical role. Yeah, that's a good point. And of course, there's been a lot of research in the GI science community about uh, scientific communication with maps and, you know, the idea that maps depicted in the popular media are seen as, you know, some sort of verified truth. So um, being able to communicate the degree of uncertainty has obviously been a big research area in our community. So it's important to carry that forward. So um, thanks for pointing that out. Um, here's a question um, that came in. This is uh, specifically for uh, Dr. Emch, but um, I think it could be, you know, something everyone could comment on. Um, the question is, there is currently a lot of skepticism regarding vaccines and COVID-19 tests in many parts of Africa. How were you able to develop community trust and collect serology samples in Ghana? Do you have any local collaborators involved in actual GI science work? And uh, I'll turn this over um, to you, Mike, in a moment. But just for everyone else, I think it's a great question in terms of how we collaborate with others um, to actually understand the, the process um, of the disease uh, dynamics themselves, that this kind of research isn't necessarily done in isolation typically. So we need collaborative networks. And if you're going to do research in places, you often need to collaborate with the, the community members in that place. So um, I certainly welcome comments from everyone on, on that general topic. But maybe first I'll turn it over to um, Mike to respond to this specific part of the question. Yeah, so our um, collaborators in, in Ghana are at the, uh, uh, it's actually part of the Ministry of Health. It's, the, it's, a, it's called the Kantampo Health and Demographic Surveillance System. And uh, it's in central Ghana. And then in Accra at the University of um, Ghana, uh, in uh, um, it, there's a research center called Noguchi. Anyways, so that, uh, and, and Noguchi has done, as of a few weeks ago, they had done 99% of the, the, um, the virus testing in Ghana. They have done close to 100,000 virus tests. And for the population, that's a lot better, if you've been watching the news, than a lot of U.S. states. Uh, and, uh, uh, anyways, um, uh, and so um, it just so happens that, uh, so we, we have a, a malaria vaccine trial with, um, this is one of the countries we're doing it in, 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 in Gabon and Malawi or the other two. And anyways, um, the, we had just done a, um, a couple of different short courses, one in Kintampo and the other in Accra, uh, in GIS and public health. And, and it was a, there are demographers, there are geographers, there are um, people that are molecular epidemiologists that, that are just smart people that learn some, you know, some skills. So we have really good relationships with people there. And we, and, you know, like for instance, the Kintampo, um, Research Center um, it has a um, you know a, a, a GIS uh, um, unit, uh, and so so these are these are really good research centers. And and uh, but I, nowhere on earth do I work. Do I do my? I, I'm working with local collaborators on everything, and so um, this would it would be impossible to do no matter. Um, how you try to do this, and but we do bring more geospatial, analytical, and statistical skills to the table than they have. Um, and 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 you know, I would suggest to everybody that uh, you know, rather than doing sort of colonial research, that you involve people as true collaborators from the beginning and and uh you know and and then and then uh and and so that and you know that's that's what i strive to do and uh and so so that is um um th th this is true collaborative research and and uh and they will get better at the gi science part of this through this project very good thanks and um you know, I'd be interested in hearing from our other panelists about who they're collaborating with and how how they arrange those collaborations, because that's a very valuable um, thing for this research community. Well, 
Well, I feel like I talk a lot about this this particular topic, and you know, kudos to Michael for for that kind of approach because I feel like not only is that um, just more ethically um, appropriate, but it really leads to better science. I mean, fundamentally, and better future scientists as well. So I, I think that's really important. Um, one of the one of the I'll talk maybe for what just briefly respond uh, with one of the challenges that we have. Um, sometimes when we work with the community. Um, the, it, it's really hard to know exactly who to go to, um, you know, who to approach, what kinds of experience they've had before with other researchers at your institution. Um, maybe there are already existing collaborations. Um, maybe um, there's past histories that you have to be careful of. So anytime doing that kind of collaboration, uh, you know, it's also important to have a historical context, and it, it's a real big challenge, I think, for any institution, any researcher that's trying to do that. Um, so one of the things that uh, we're trying to do with the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience is actually systematically try to support that here at ASU, trying to get a handle on where are the collaborations already, literally where. Um, where are our students? Our students are really great um, uh, avenues into um, different kinds of institutions and to the places that they live, the neighborhoods that they might live. So um, just thinking holistically and using um, our own geospatial technologies to try to make those connections. Where are people working? Um, those are the kinds of things that we're trying to do. Uh, and just being respectful of what has gone on in the past uh, previously. The fact that our community members have a lot of capacity and a lot of knowledge, not necessarily the same knowledge that we have, but um, uh, very synergistic kinds of knowledge to put together for that. Oh, so we're working with the um, uh, County Public Health Department, for example. United Way is a really great partner uh, because they are sort of convening of many different organizations. So um, conveners of organizations are also really, really excellent places to start, like the United Way, because then you, you can actually access a lot of different kinds of institutions through organizations like that, Salvation Army, um, city, city governments. There's a county association of governments, the Maricopa County Association of Governments, that is really valuable to our work. Very good, thanks. Anyone else want to weigh in about their collaborative efforts or the importance of collaboration? Well, I think, um, so. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kathleen. Okay, um, I was just gonna say, so yeah, just it's interesting to think about, but I, I, I would say that in my case, um, I had collaborations, we were working on other collaborative projects, and then this gave us an opportunity to um, work, continue to work together. So whether it was um, for on mobility, working with um, civil and environmental engineers who are working at Mobility, University of Maryland, Maryland Transportation Institute, etc. We already had a solid collaboration and could really, and, and the great thing about that is that you could kind of hit the ground running in a sense um, to, to consider what you can do together. Um, and with many of my collaborations with the School of Medicine or with the School of Public Health, these are already collaborations um, that are in place. But I would say, you know, for many researchers that, of course, new opportunities come along with, with COVID and pandemic and um, that if you see an opportunity to build, to start a new collaboration or reach out, because there are many, many different groups out there who would love to have a geospatial person on their team to bring in that perspective. So I think it's very fertile ground for starting off a new collaboration and if you haven't got any collaborations it's a great opportunity to start because again you'll be able to take those collaborations and do other things down the road too so it's there's so many great reasons for why collaboration is fun and interesting and broadening and all of those things so there there, there is an opportunity to both work with groups you may already be working with and consider what could we do together in, in, with respect to COVID, um, as well as branch out and find new teams, new new individuals to work with. Yeah, so I want to echo what my fellow panelists already uh, mentioned in terms of the impressive list of uh, collaborators they've had experience working with 
I want to emphasize just one type of collaborations, uh, which is with uh, health agencies and the stakeholders. They represent real world problem solving experiences and uh, practices. And I think uh, during the course of uh, the fight against this, uh, this crisis, where basically our scientific experience is living through real world experience simultaneously. And uh, I see a tremendous value of directly interacting with the stakeholders and to see the need from their perspectives that would, I think, better ground our scientific work. Great, thanks to all of you. Um, we're just about out of time, but I'll give our panelists uh, another opportunity if there's anything um, else that you want to add uh, at the end, you're welcome to uh, chime in. Well, I certainly would like to thank you for organizing this panel. And as I said, um, it, it's just wonderful to see the work that you all are doing and um, to see it harnessed uh, in such an important problem for now. But of course, we all know that the urgent should not displace the important. And it will be important and interesting to see how, as several of you have said, what you learn as we scramble to put the work that we've worked on for many, many years to good use now informs, I mean, will we see a step function increase, for example, in the way the research goes forward? Because we're all you all in particular are responding so creatively to this challenge. So I think that's the interesting question, as you all have said in different ways as this goes forward, is um, what, will, what will you and we learn in the near term that will be of benefit to us all in the long term? So thank you for all that you do. And I apologize, I have to go to my next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Those were some uh, wonderful closing words and very inspiring. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Patricia, Kathleen, uh, Mike, Shawen, uh, and Amy. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. It was a great experience. I want to thank the participants. Um, I also want to point out that UCGIS is um, collecting um, research and other activities related to COVID-19 so we can collate them. I know there's a lot of efforts like this underway, but we particularly want to highlight um, the activities of our member institutions. And uh, you can find a link to fill out a form just to tell us what you're up to. And we're happy to um, you know, share that information with our research community. And uh, the, the link is simply ucgis.org slash COVID-19-resources, but you can find it on um, the UCGIS webpage at ucgis.org. So I encourage you to go there. Um, and I also want to invite you to join our poster session in the remainder of the symposium, which is going on um, through Thursday. So thank you very much to all of our panelists. Thanks to the participants. And uh, thanks also to Shilung uh, Shaw for co-organizing this. Everyone should stay safe and healthy and uh, take care of yourselves. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye, Patricia. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Kathleen. Bye, Kathleen. Bye. Bye bye.